But I, I want to, to, what I want to do to now uh, is, is to um, advance a, an unusual position, which is which almost some people find difficult to, 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 to understand or digest, which is that the proposition that Orientalism is perhaps the most important academic field we have today, with the proviso that its current methodology, scholarly approach, worldview, and consciousness be revised, reformed, and reshaped. Which is to say that this does indeed involve a, or presuppose Orientalism's total transformation. Some may object that if it is transformed in this manner, and to such a degree that it is no longer Orientalism. I believe that this is not true, that what I am proposing is simply a humane and wise form of Orientalism, not just intelligent and certainly not anti-human, colonialist, and destructive. Think of it that I am using the same building blocks that conventional colonialist Orientalism had used, but I want to build a different kind of building, a humane one a eco-friendly, peaceful, and conducive to good living. With these blocks, which are mostly philological, and that's what really Orientalism deals with in, 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 in the great bulk of its uh, existence, I want to construct a building that teaches peace and humanity, <coughs> wisdom and forbearance, not an Auschwitz incinerator in Nazi Germany or a colonial office in Cairo or Jakarta which, by the way, both have been built through the good offices of traditional Orientalism. Now, before I proceed, I would like to foreground what I am proposing in a, in a few presuppositions that are foundational for such a proposal, for such an enterprise. The first of these is this, that the study of any culture as of any phenomenon, immediate or distant, will ineluctably be framed by the value system and cultural imperatives of the scholar, irrespective of any claim to objectivity. This is what it means not to have, or the impossibility of having, a neutral point of view from which to study anything in the world. Objectivity, even if it were attainable, is not even desirable, because whatever it finds, whatever it understands, would then be irrelevant to us, to our lives. To study or try to understand something from a non-point of view is to have a colorless and inopposite, not to mention disconnected and even misplaced view of reality. So not only that we need subjectivity, but we cannot do without it. The issue, the problem, is not that subjective knowledge is itself problematic, but rather that it is problematic if, and only if, it is misused, misapplied, or mistreated. Almost everything we know comes from subjective knowledge. And so the question becomes, how do we deal with subjectivity? How do we harness it ethically? But to ask or to say, how do we deal with subjectivity? The question, how do we deal with subjectivity, is a vague proposition, a vague question. For this question should be cast as follows. How should the subject acquire knowledge? For the subject is already subjected, and from that, there is no escape. Hence, it is futile to even attempt to be objective, because the subject is inherently, innately, the manifestation of itself. So how should it, should she, should he, should they acquire knowledge? The second presupposition is that since our subjective conditions determine our approach to and search for knowledge, we must always be aware of what these conditions are at least to the best extent we can, and with good faith of meaning to know uh, who we are. Coming to terms with the condition, as any therapist and psychologist will tell you, is not only the first step toward finding solutions to the problem, they are indispensable, which is to say you will get nowhere if you do not acknowledge the, 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 the problems. No pathology can be cured without this awareness. The third presupposition, is that an integral part of this self-consciousness, this awareness, is that Orientalism and its effects are misplaced, that the field is not doing very well. The field has been in operation, so to speak, for a good century and a half. And thus far, we cannot point to any contribution it has made 
which can be described as having a positive, humane, and compassionate effect on our ways of life in the world. If anything, we know that the opposite has happened. For, it, for if this were not the case, we would not be speaking about the Orientalist problem in the first place. Both the public media and governments were and remain the greatest beneficiaries of Orientalist scholarship, whether it is in France, Israel, Australia, or the United States. And now, actually, to be honest with you, almost everywhere else in the world. Witness what is being done by the French governments with their Islamophobic and oppressive policies, or our American government, not to mention the classical case of Israeli settler colonialism and its quasi-genocidal policies. A good number of students who study Islamic languages and the history of Islam have their ultimate ambition serving in the foreign offices and State Department of Western governments. And we now we, we know what, what, what that means. Some graduate, uh, some graduate from Orientalist and Islamic Studies departments to become uh, a, a journalist, contributing to Islam Islamophobia and demonizing of Muslims and their culture and religion. At a higher, more abstract, yet simultaneously concrete level, Orientalism has turned a blind eye to our general predicament in terms of the impending environmental disaster and all that is that this climate crime entails and implies. The field is lar not largely, I would say it is totally silent about these, uh, these issues. Specialists in Islam, with rare exceptions, have not even begun to reflect on how their research and fields of study bear on what is emerging as the biggest, th biggest threat ever to face the humanity. Despite the gravity of, or of, of the cultural, political, and environmental crises, they go on with their 19th century style of scholarship as if the world can be studied and judged from the perspective of Western comfort, paying little attention to the tragic existence of hundreds of millions in the world outside of the West. Just think of the near silence of the field in the face of the massive genocides in Myanmar and China. The field is not only silent, but in its silence is complicit with these atrocities. In other words, so far, the field of Orientalist and Islamic studies has had a shameful history, beginning from its mid-19th century prolific production until the present. The, the fourth piece of position is that the current field of, Oriental of Orientalism continues to operate with what I call a philological culture of sovereignty, a culture inherited as a tradition in the anthropological sense of the term, a tradition that constitutes also in the anthropological sense a habitus. Philology is of different types and comes in different forms and, sh and shapes. And Orientalism's philology is of the sovereign type. The specialist of Islam, therefore, continues to regard himself or herself as a sovereign agent, able to pronounce on the tradition according to terms that betray the epistemic priorities of colonialism and control. I have explored in detail these two themes in my Restating Orientalism, and therefore shall not go into detail here, but I should emphasize the fact that the recent rise in the number of Muslim scholars in this field, and I don't mean the people who are here, but some others, <laughs> um, has not had any effect on changing thing, this picture. It is unfortunate, to say the least, that this new scholarly demographic shift has not managed to change almost anything in the philological and so sovereign culture of the field, a field that remains tightly controlled through the professional rules of the establishment. These rules, especially as they relate to publishing in periodicals and book series, to promotions and grant applications, mm -hmm. continue to exhibit the same modes of conduct that, prevailed, that pre pervaded the field for a century and more. The fifth piece of position relating to sovereignty is the strong presence of epistemic hubris, which is also to say that, philologically speaking, the field has not yet learned to act with humility. I do not mean by humility only its basic day-to-day -day sense. I employ the concept in a robust philosophical sense and will leave its exploration till tomorrow when I deal with the themes of reforming modernity. Since this matter has very much to do with the conception of the new human, 
But I should say here that philological humility is of the essence as a technology of the self that we need to cultivate as soon as possible for the simple reason that such technology and its cultivation has much to do and in highly qualitative terms with everything I have so far said about our crisis, be it political or cultural or environmental. The sixth and final piece of position, which is to say what I take to be truths of the field, is that like all other academic disciplines, there is a deep gulf between what we preach and teach and what we actually live or live by. This state of affairs seems most natural to us nowadays, but it was not always like that. For millennia, social leadership and at times rulers have equated and deemed mutual, mutually integral actions of daily life and the philosophical principles by which one lives. The identity of the two, the, the speech and action, or near identity in any case, has always been taken for granted, except in modernity, where they have been separated from each other, and separated totally. With the benefit of hindsight, this is not surprising at all, but it, 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 it would take distinguished scholarly careers, such as that of Pierre Ado, to tell us this simple truth. When, and when Ado came to view, we thought of his enterprise as mon a monumental one driving even stellar intellectuals like Foucault to draw heavily on him and load him as a major contribution, contributor to the study of philosophy and subjectivity. The identity between speech and deed was effectively an art, an art of living, living meaningfully, deliberately, ethically, and responsibly, to be formed by what Althusser came, called an ideologi ideological state apparatus is one thing, to be formed as a stoic disciple or philosopher, or as a Sufi, Murid, or Sheikh, is quite another. I think these two representations are the extreme ends of the spectrum, where two qualitatively different technologies are at play. To cultivate a new kind of scholarship, to begin to see the other in human and the human terms, with epistemic sympathy, with epistemic humility, as an equal, not an object, as even a possible teacher and instructor. All this cannot be done without changing both the technique of the self or techniques of the self formation, as well as the content and substance of these techniques. If we assume, as we should, that knowledge is never innocent of the social, conceptual, material, political, and power networks within which it is cultivated, then engaging in knowledge production, the raison d'etre of, of the scholar, comes with a grave ethical and moral responsibility, but one that can no longer be formed through the liberal tradition or exclusively within our central domain's discursive formations. As an instrument of power, and one that in modernity stands in dialectical relationship with it, knowledge is a weapon that can inflict cruel violence, including genocide and much else. To cultivate it within an ethical framework framework is to engage, first and foremost, in a series of self-interrogations about the justifiability of the very concept of scholarship in the first place. Why, that is, the very choice of entering into this domain of production, this domain of discursive engagement. The question should be, why am I here studying this? What is the meaning of the content of my work, of my job, to me? to life in general, what forms of scholarship are ethically justifiable and what not? Or we might ask, is, there, is, there, is every topic and subject we study and publish about worthy of the effort? How can a scholar, through a specific and precisely formulated research project, partake in the social concerns of his or her society? Would the list of research questions be the same if we were to factor in this question? <coughs> which presupposes asking questions about the relationship between oneself as a scholar and the society he or she or they lives in. Do I owe anything to anyone while asking such research questions? If I study the agricultural and economic situation in early Mamluk Nile flooding 
I owe it to myself to ask the primary question of why I am doing so. How does it benefit society or even any single person in the world other than me? Does such a study have the potential to teach us about any agricultural methods being developed today with the revolutionary technology, changing patterns of the Nile flow, also the result of this technology and so many other variables? If the answer is no, for instance, we might think that agriculture is important to study for, say, political considerations. And then we must decide how much information about Mamluk agriculture uh, is necessary before we say, enough, I have what I need to decide the patterns of political involvement and, 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 and action. Or if I'm studying legal history during the first century of Islam, what is the foregrounding reason for me to do this? How do I do it? What are the implications? What, who and what this will serve? The way in which this field of research has, 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 has things uh, is, is an excellent example of how, uh, uh, of how a, field, a field of research can become just another justification for colonialism. But it does not have to be this way. It is all in the approach and the ethical justifiability of the foregrounding reasons for taking up a particular question. Whatever supposes itself to be an explanation or justification or rationalizing of the choice of entering into this field or that does in no way circumscribe or circumvent the ethical quality of the derivative questions that the scholar asks of the field and what it is that, and that the answers to these questions aim to accomplish. The prevalent attitude within professional historiography is of course that history is a field of knowledge. And as such, any question posed within its boundaries is as legitimate as the next. In other words, reflecting our extreme sense of individualism and the supposed moral and rational autonomy, who is to say what is a legitimate or valid historical question and what is not? The entire range of historical space and time is equally open to investigation without prejudging the legitimacy of membership qua membership. Only the results or answers given to the formally posed questions are subjected to evaluation as good, bad, solid, pervasive, per per persuasive, flimsy, or otherwise. But as a rule, the very questions or choices of historical topics are never themselves interrogated as if they stand in a neutral and objective space. No one, to my knowledge, has ever cast doubt on a histor historian's work insofar as the topics chosen for st the study are concerned, be they minting practices under the King di the dynasty, the uses and, of, and economy of salt in the new kingdom of the pharaonic Egypt, the structure of Mamluk armies, filth in 19th century Paris, the history of mosquitoes in the Malayas, or for that matter, the conditions of felicity in the speech of a Manitoba village idiot. The extent to which this state of affairs is integral to the modern sovereignty of knowledge has never been a topic of, of investigation, much less a serious one. This, on a, plain, on a plain logical level, does not make sense, for to ignore foundational reasons and give full attention to their effects is utterly nonsensical, not to mention the danger and risk in doing so. The most disturbing aspect of this picture is that it is accepted as a truism that asking questions, any questions, is an ideologically neutral activity. The non-restrictive, freely open attitude is largely the function of the foundational assumption that history is there for us to discover. That is, that its truths are ultimately objective and that it is knowable a mimesis of the natural sciences, which is a model that, that, that history has always aimed to, to emulate, or replicate even. History, in other words, is ours, and our knowledge of it is sovereign. If we are the subject, the active knower, then it is the object, the terrain that our minds chart. Undeniably, there is a widespread belief among professional historians that history and historiography are cumulative in nature, revisionist along the way, 
but ultimately distant, destined toward the teleology, namely discovering a particular truth about a period, a field of sub or subfield, an event, a dynasty, an emperor, an economy, or an issue in an endless series of issues. That's why history is commanded by our sovereign knowledge, and we therefore epistemically own it. It is not at all about us. We are merely neutral observers doing our job, which is simply to be scholars. Furthermore, this race for the truth of history is also claimed to be self-evident as an endeavor that is intrinsically valuable and in need of no prior justification. Knowledge, including historical knowledge, is itself is self-justified since it stems from a sovereign structure of thought, one that has been at the center of my critical gaze in restating Orientalism. In an intellectual world in which the distinction and separation between the ethical and everything else prevails, sovereign knowledge, the source of so-called intellectual freedom, translates into precisely the kind of questions whose answers yield the destructive effects of, of oppression colonialism and genocide. None of these, it must be remembered, would have been possible without history. And if these are distinctly modern phenomena, which they are, then it is the modern forms of history that manifest the problem. Sovereign knowledge is not freedom, but one that is by definition reckless and devoid of ethical content, as the history of modern history amply attests. The in inquisitive freedom afforded by the discipline of historiography, including philology, furthermore replicates those freedoms that are, that are propounded in liberal democracy, freedoms unquestioned as long as they operate, more or less, within both the established norms of the profession and the forms of knowledge that regulate a, a particular view of history. The liberal Parallel to these is this socio-political order and the knowledge forms governing capitalist modes of production, forms that in turn determine the, per the, the, the perpetually uncertain teleology of that order. It is, for instance, a can canonical truth of professional historiography to reject any understanding oppositional to its concept of enlightenment reason, an understanding that, for instance, separates between fact and value, a sacred distinction in the very natural sciences that it strives so hard to uh, imitate. It would be an incurable sacrilege, therefore, to even gesture toward the possibility that history has, in the main, no other function than to provide ethical instruction. People will shiver at this thought. Such a heresy is inextricably entailed by another pervasive creed that the, dominates the very course and content of historiographical, historiographical practice. Walter Manuelo has argued that modernity's concept of history is singular, recognizing that is a single line of narrative. When a new development occurs, what existed before it is pushed back into the past, precisely into history and the historical. This process, pervasively epistemological, carries with it profound implications since the very conception of linear, singular history, coupled with a transient theology of progress, always locates the past within the marginal and less privileged. History is history, less developed, and thus wholly or partially primitive, medieval, or medievalist worse, anti-modern, and most importantly, irrelevant to the new and modern, to the true expression of progress. Beginning with Vico and Nietzsche, and ending more recently with, Wade, uh, with Hayden White, this conception has been challenged to the core, for especially with the latter, with White, historiography and the modern historical imagination have been shown to be deeply implicated not only in nationalism and modern state domination, but also in imperialism and colonialism, that is, in the mechanics of destructive power. My analysis throughout the, that, that book has in effect argued this much with the caveat that history and Orientalism are extensions 
of each other, just as modern philosoph philosophy, science, and economics divide among themselves the labor of conquering the world, sentient and insentient. History, to play on one of Hayden White's famous terms, plots violence. And as such, it has the self-same epistemic structures of Orientalism. And much of Orientalism is nothing but history in its most modern and thus power-laden form. By contrast, in its circulatory model, the form that pre prevailed in pre-modern China and India, history possessed, as Nietzsche vehemently argued, in another context, in, in, the, in his early works, a moral and ethical backbone. In, instead of being an instrument of building the constructive, uh, the destructive political national identities, it contained narratives of ethical instruction. Precisely the central themes of classical Islamic history, tarikh, which stood at no remove uh, from shari'i and mystical discourses. As many know, Adab, biography, Quranic studies, hadith studies, and so much else were all structurally interconnected with history. Once we recognize that our modern historiography is plotted in no less mythical and imaginary ways than any other, we will be on our way to articulating a more healthy conception of the value of human life, not only as embedded in a complex environment that sustains this life, but that also instructs us in our study of the other. The academic study of the Orient is just an instance in this overall picture, one that commands a special sense of urgency. Thank you. Thank you. All right, I'll be extremely brief. Bismillah, <laughs> alhamdulillah. Um, I heard this uh, really erudite uh, lecture as commentary on the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam in Sahih Muslim, in which he makes dua, "Allahumma inni a'udhu ka min ilm la yinfa." I seek oh, protection uh, of Allah from knowledge that does not benefit. And um, perhaps, as Professor Halak was developing his argument. I, uh, from what I heard, and I may be, I may be wrong, and I, I need to be corrected. But I, had, I got the impression that the question and purpose of knowledge, of acquiring knowledge, needs to predate knowledge, predates the exercise itself. That we need to know, we need to have our ethics in order before we acquire knowledge. And. I think that to some degree, that's very much a formation of, you know, we are, we are given, if you will, a society, a community, in which our notions of what knowledge is, what knowledge can do, what kind of jobs it can get us, what kind of friends it can get us, that is a given. And that one doesn't have any agency over, perhaps a little bit. It is knowledge itself that becomes in a, in, a, in a very important way for our students, going, you know, starting with myself, knowledge itself becomes that process, especially if you're passionate about it, and there's no better example than Professor Halak. Um, when you're passionate about it, that knowledge transforms you. You don't go into it thinking, I'm going to change the world for a better place, necessarily. Maybe that's, you know, if that's why you came in, good for you. So, without uh, rejecting at all the idea that we need to be ethical, we need to seek God's protection from knowledge that does not benefit, or knowledge that does harm, and there is a lot of pseudo-knowledge that does harm. I think that love for knowledge itself is something that is transformative, that helps us it, it exposes us to possibilities of investigating our intentions, investigating our directions. Even if you are learning about the village idiots in Manitoba, you actually learn something. And so I will end this with, uh, uh, with this discourse that Sheikh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah has in his Ar-Risala fil-Mahabba, 
he has a risala on love. And in that risala, he talks about, he starts with ethics, whether you can love anything other than God. And that takes into the question of whether there is something that is truly good other than God. And he says, there are things that people who do not even know God love because that's part of their love for what is good. And, and he gives the example of knowledge as one of those things that people love and they may not love knowledge for the sake of God. But that once they encounter that knowledge and they love it, that becomes mahabba. And that knowledge then takes them to God. That knowledge makes them appreciate the reasons for which they are acquiring that knowledge. So that's an internal process. And, and the reason I, and this is not really, as I said, a rejection of what Professor Halak is saying or a critique, but rather maybe merely an addendum, which is that knowledge itself is beautiful and it can transform, it can in fact improve you will, you know, if you're lucky, you will come across one of the Professor Halak's books uh, when when you are uh, in the library trying to trying to uh, you know spend your time because you love to learn. So that I think is is, and sometimes you learn just really bad stuff that actually is ethically uh, improving, it improves you in some ways. You can't tell. And so I think that, and I see that among uh, my students, and you know. Uh, even historians, people who are doing intellectual history and they want to do intellectual history just because it's cool, just because they couldn't get into something else. And uh, they're transformed in the process and, and, and become, uh, you know, often many of them convert to Islam. Many of them begin to appreciate the limitations of, modern, of, of the modern secular West as a result of that history. And I think that modern history, modern his, uh, critical history, uh, really allows us to do that uh, more than many other disciplines, which perhaps do not engage with the non-West as much. So while it is true and absolutely true that history has often paved the way for Orientalist intentions, and pseudo-history has often led to, or not even pseudo-history, it's sort of an expression. So history becomes an expression of one sovereign power, and that is problematic. And I, I completely agree with Professor Halak's emphasis on um, having ikhlas. Why is it that you're learning? What is the good that you're seeking? But also, your level of ikhlas, your ability to know this, your ability to ask questions, is limited by your prior knowledge. You can't even ask those questions until you get into it. So I can't ask you too much until you start. And that's why I think knowledge itself is one of those things that God has made beautiful, um, despite the possibility that it can be abused. And that's all I have to say. One minute response. Yeah. I'm not excluding. Uh, I'm, I'm not saying that we should exclude areas of, of phenomena and not study them. Uh, and we, we have to be. Uh, only choosing some that, all I'm saying is that when we ask the questions about historiography and, uh, and, and history and whatever we want to do in, 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 in that vein, is that we structure our research agenda with an, a, an overlaying ethical uh, component. In other words, the, the, the thinking of, of how is this going to be promoting the good of people. Mm -hmm. Uh, to, to, and, and, and with that, you come to say, for example, when I'm studying some other poor soul in Africa or in Asia 500 years ago, I also, if it's ethical, I will actually empathize with that person and actually say, maybe I should listen to him or her more carefully. So perhaps I can learn something because to be ethical is also to be, to, to allow yourself to listen to people and treat them as a humans. To, to, as equals to you, that they can teach you as much as you can teach them. This I don't see in Oriental scholarship. It has been always sovereign. It has always been looking down on everything that is studied, precisely like any other field. Like in Orientalism, this is the whole idea of the book. Orientalism is not different than engineering. 
How? Because Orientals, like in engineers, they look at nature and say, the, the engineers, how can I split the mountain in two half to, 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 to create a road? Not thinking about anything else. All their function is really to manipulate nature in order to get. All I'm saying is that we need to ethicize our scholarship, not to exclude phenomena. We can study anything we want, and we should, but it has to be layered with, with ethics in addition to what we have. We have wonderful tools. The Orientalists are actually very smart and clever, and they have elaborated lots of uh, philological tools that are admirable. But they are not based on any ethical impulse. They, uh, that's why they got involved in, in, in colonialism. And, and some Orientalists actually were hired, were hired by governments as policy uh, advisors and, and whatnot to plan massacres, and huge massacres. Some of the best names in Orientalism were involved in the planning of massacres in Africa and Asia. Right? We, well, I think many people know this, but it's not enough, enough well, uh, well advertised. So that's what I'm saying. But I'm not uh, excluding anything. Fantastic. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm just, uh, and I, I thank you. And I, yeah, I, I know that we will need to close very soon, but I, I'm wondering if part of the problem is, is the fact that academia has turned scholarship into a career. And we've lost the sense of scholarship as a vocation. <coughs> And so, so, you know, for example, we, we, we are welcome to go into any field and to study it. And, and if we're really clever and good at it, we can become uh, associate and full professors in, a, in an expedited, you know, period of time, in an expedited way. And I, I, I think that, you know, th th this is, again, a, and it's not to, not to, um, not to, um, uh, not to uh, discourage any, any institution or any kind of institution or to, or to disparage any kind of academic institution, but I, you know, I, I feel like it's very hard to have these kinds of ethical questions about intentionality of study outside of a, of a faith-informed environment, you know, because our academic mentorship uh, isn't really mentorship in the traditional sense, right? It's more of a skills-based, utility-based form of mentorship where, where if, if we were to sit down with a student and say, really, what, what, is, what is your intention? Why are you doing this, and is it ethical? I mean, do you, have you, it, it may be seen by the secular academy as being overreach uh, from in, in our role as, as teachers and as mentors. And so I, I think that this, this may be one of the ways in which we, we have to decolonize the way we think about education, is we have to rediscover scholarship as vocation rather than his career. And, uh, and I was always puzzled as a graduate student to find several of my colleagues who had no particular interest in what it is that they were becoming specialists in. And they had no particular moral, ethical, uh, existential connection or, 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 or sense of, of, um, of uh, calling to what it was that they were studying. But they were very good at what they did and they've all done really well, you know? And, uh, and I, I think that, I think that and, and, and as I work through that, I mean, I, I, I have to you know, be very respectful of them and what they've achieved. But at the same time, I, I do think that we have commodified scholarship and we've turned it into something that at least traditionally for us, it was never, it was never that. You know, we, we have many stories of people traveling to foreign countries and sitting with a sheikh for 10 or 20 years before they were even allowed to teach, you know? And, and, and now we're talking about the five-year PhD and we're cranking these people out because it's become a it's become a machine. It's become a career, and so and we and we uh, you know we, we give people enough Arabic to read a few hadiths and then they can and then they can write a dissertation and off they go, and uh, and without any sense of the of the holistic tradition or or the the larger context in which they're operating. So, you know, I, I do think this is part of the problem that we're up against is the fact that that academia has turned scholarship into a non-transformative career path that, that, that doesn't, so we don't talk about ennoblement, we don't talk about effacement, we don't talk about uh, the transformation of, of, of the, you know, the, the aspiring scholar in, in moral and ethical ways. So now we have all of these nasty personalities who are senior professors who have never had any kind of transformative engagement or mentorship and, and have never been asked to think about the, the moral and ethical uh, aspects of their, of their work. And I, I think this is one of the problems that we're up against today. <laughs>